Thanks, Denise. Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Give me just a second. I'm going to try to be brief. I have trouble with that, so I'll ask for your forgiveness in advance. I just want to tell you a little bit about Canadian Association for Equality, or CAFE. Um, as Diddy has said, we're a registered educational charity. We've been active now for about three, three and a half years. Uh, we do a variety of things. Uh, a lot of our focus is on public awareness and consciousness raising activities through events on campus, through advertisement uh, campaigns such as the billboard ad we ran earlier in the year looking at domestic violence against men. Uh, we also do outreach um, by participating in street festivals and uh, in conferences put on by organizations that we support. Um, and over the course of the last year, I think the biggest focus for us has become operating the Canadian Center for Men and Families, which is Toronto's first sort of all-purpose hub for the health and welfare of boys, men, fathers, and families. Many of you have visited us. If you haven't been there, I'd encourage you to check it out. Not all that, not all that far away. It's close, actually, to both U of T and Ryerson at Carleton and Jarvis. As Denise mentioned, after tonight, as part of a fundraising initiative to reaffirm our commitment to holding these critical events at a variety of university campuses, and also to support the vital life-changing services and programs that we offer at the Center for Men and Families, we will be holding a fundraising reception. It's $50. It gets you a more exclusive access to our guest of honor, Kathy Young. You can join us at the bar um, uh, downstairs. I believe there will be both food and, and beverages available for you. You can also make any contribution you like to our campus outreach initiatives. This week, any donation you make will be earmarked directly to our campus outreach work at U of T and at other universities as well. Uh, we're very active, not just in Toronto. We have groups at McGill, at SFU in Vancouver, in Ottawa, um, and in, uh, in several other places. Um, we think it's vitally important that these conversations about fatherlessness, about uh, male suicide, about violence against men, about the educational um, underachievement of boys, these have to happen on campus. If you agree with that, you need to help us because we cannot do this on our own. We've dealt with a lot of challenges. Just about 20 minutes ago, we had our most recent challenge. I don't know if you noticed, but we had to have a few troublemakers escorted out of the room, and we thank the police for doing that um, so quickly and gracefully. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that we're up against when you talk about men's health and men's issues. So we've done a lot of work. I think we've come a long way, but we cannot do that without each of your support. So please contribute whatever you can. Come to the reception later. Um, put today's uh, admission to a, towards a membership. We have a low income option of $20. Regular membership is $60. And I should say, or reinforce what I said earlier, we are a charity, which means we can give you charitable receipts uh, for your contributions. Um, just the last thing I'm going to say is to visit us online at equalitycanada.com or menandfamilies.org. The latter website is specific to the Center for Men and Families. If you know somebody who's suffering, who needs uh, counseling or peer support or legal aid or fathering support, all of these are programs that we offer free of charge uh, at the Center for Men and Families. So I think we're doing some important work, but we need you to help us to get the word out um, and to bring people to see us. Uh, I'll give you one example of the kind of people that we're uh, hearing from. Uh, just yesterday I got a call from a man who had been in an abusive relationship for a number of years. Um, the latest was an attack from a female partner where he was actually bitten on his chest. He finally got up the courage to call the police. They came out, they looked at the bite mark, they heard from the witness who corroborated his story. They arrested him, put him in jail, charged him with domestic violence, brought her to the hospital. Um, so there are issues here, and I think any time there's a victim who's suffering, whether it's a man or a woman, we should be equally concerned, and right now we're just not. So these are important issues. These are issues that really transcend gender. We get a lot of men and women both reaching out to us, looking for support for their loved ones to make their families healthier and stronger. So these are the important, this is the important and unique work that really only CAFE, the Center for Men and Families, is doing. Again, please, please contribute whatever you can um, after today's event. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, thank you, Denise. And thank you, everyone from CAFE, uh, for this uh, wonderful reception.
I'm uh, really, really happy to be here in Canada. It's unfortunate that because of circumstances, the event couldn't be held at the university as originally planned. Um, but I think this is going to be a great event, hopefully, and uh, I hope you will not be disappointed. Um, so, um, Denise mentioned my book, which I wrote um, 15 years ago, um, Ceasefire. Um, my original working title, by the way, was Beyond the Gender Wars. And it's interesting that thinking about it uh, the other day, um, I realized that so many of the things I was writing about back then are still incredibly relevant today. And in fact, probably more so. I was hoping when I wrote this book that we were nearing what I saw as a very unfortunate cycle of uh, rancor, grievance, and anger that was going on in terms of gender politics, um, both in the women's movement and unfortunately in what was done, the sort of incipient men's movement, which had back then much less currency because we didn't really have the internet yet. So it was really much harder for people to reach each other. Um, sadly, many of these issues today um, are uh, actually worse, I would say, than they were in 1999 when my book was published. Uh, there is even more antagonism. Uh, there is even more uh, anger on both sides. There is even more, of course, we, we now have an outrage culture that sort of existed back then, but now everything happens much faster. And of course, with the internet, uh, the politics of personal grievance really have reached a kind of um, culmination. Uh, not to knock the internet has done many wonderful things. Um, it's enabled, among other things, writers like me to reach a much, much broader audience than we ever could before. Uh, but I think, uh, among other things, it has also enabled, uh, first of all, people to congregate into these uh, kind of like-minded enclaves where you never really have to listen to dissenting mm -hmm. voices. And you can spend all your time talking to people who think just like you and who really reinforce all of your biases and all of your stereotypes and so on. And you know, this really has, in some ways, I think, worsened the public climate. We also have this outrage culture, which now you know, many people are starting to see as a serious problem. Uh, so getting to uh, my more immediate topic of the politics of gender and victimization, um, uh, Denise brought up cyberbullying as one of the topics that I've written about. And coincidentally, uh, just yesterday in New York, the United Nations hosted a panel on cyber violence against women and girls, which is the last in a series of such events over the past year. Uh, speaker after speaker addressed the issue of misogyny and, uh, I'm thinking, and sexist harassment on the internet. Um, and there are many problems, by the way, with how cyber violence was defined, um, with really what was defined as sexist speech, also classified as a form of violence. And I, you would kind of think that with all the things that the United Nations has to deal with currently, with the rise of the horrible terrorist forces like ISIS and uh, you know, other things going on in the world, you know, equating uh, sexist speech with violence really should be, uh, as people on the left like to say, problematic. <laughs> but, you know, but uh, uh, apparently it's not. Uh, there was a report presented to the panel saying that 73% of women who use the internet have been subjected to online harassment. Again, you know, very broadly defined, obviously. Uh, well, one of the speakers did say that this should not be solely a women's issue. What was meant by this was that men also should be mobilized to fight online harassment against women. But of course, the missing piece here is, what about online harassment toward men? Uh, reports on online misogyny typically rely on out-of-context statistics on internet abuse of women while completely ignoring the issue of what is the corresponding figure for men, which really should be an obvious question. Uh, for instance, uh, in January uh, 14, uh, 
the American magazine Pacific Standard published a kind of groundbreaking piece by American feminist writer Amanda Hess, which in some ways really brought to the fore uh, this issue of online misogyny. And Hess wrote uh, that according to the Pew Research Center, which is a leading American uh, polling firm, which also does global research, 5% uh, of female internet users said that something had happened online that had led them into what they felt was physical danger. Now, that's an alarming figure. But of course, again, the immediate question is, you know, what is the number for men? And when I looked up the study, it turned out that the corresponding figure for men was actually very close. It was 3%, uh, which, you know, ostensibly there is a gap, but it's a gap very, very small and within the margin of error statistically. So, I mean, the Pew Research Center didn't even really regard it as a gap, and they just reported a, joy, a uh, combined figure of 4% for both uh, sexes. Uh, now, since then, since the appearance of the Amanda Hess article, which uh, you know, caused a huge uh, response, and there were male columnists who were writing that, you know, reading this article about the abuse of women online made them feel ashamed of being a man, and so on and so forth. Since then, uh, there have been several studies of gender and harassment that have come out, which show, you know, counterintuitively given all of the coverage that we've seen, uh, that actually um, online harassment may, and cyberbullying may be a worse problem for uh, men than it is for women. Uh, for instance, last year, there were two studies that um, I wrote about. <laughs> uh, there was a study by uh, a British think tank called Demos, which looked at Twitter abuse received by, a, they, they took a sample of public figures uh, ranging from uh, sports figures to writers to entertainers to journalists. Uh, uh, and they, they followed their Twitter feeds over a period of uh, two weeks. And what they found was that 2.5% uh, of the tweets sent to men were categorized as abusive uh, compared to fewer than 1% of those sent to women. Um, and of course, to the extent that the study was even noticed, the response was to say, yeah, but this is really an atypical sample, and besides, there's a problem with how they categorize the term abusive, because they really just took uh, tweets that contain swear words, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're abusive, and it doesn't capture you know, abusive tweets that don't contain swear words. Okay, so immediately the, the, the response was to try to kind of belittle and deny these findings. Uh, now, uh, so that was in August uh, of um, last year. Then in October, uh, the Pew Research Center uh, came out with a very large survey, survey of American internet users. And what they found was that 44% of men and 37% of women, so again, you know, 7% gap actually favoring women, uh, said that they had experienced online abuse. Uh, ranging from name calling to harassment and threats. Uh, and again, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the issue of how broadly we really should define online abuse. You know, is it really abuse if someone calls you a bad name on the internet? Um, you know, uh, so more women than men in terms of sort of more serious issues reported being either sexually harassed or stalked online. It wasn't a huge difference. It was maybe 9 to 10% of women and 6 to 7% of men. So again, you know, a much smaller gap than you would sort of intuitively expect given all the coverage of you know, with the horrible time that women supposedly have online. Uh, however, 10% of men compared to 7% of women reported that they had been threatened with physical violence online. Again, you know, are these serious threats? I would imagine that in most cases probably not, but you know, that goes to the issue of how do we really define online abuse. And by the way, both sexes were equally likely to report persistent online harassment, about 8% of both women and men. Uh, slight, uh, sort of slightly more men, but again within the margin of error. And here's another interesting detail from the same survey. Uh, most respondents felt that the social media environment was equally welcoming for women and men. Of those who thought there was a difference, uh, the majority actually thought the online environment was more favorable to women. 
18% of all respondents said that they felt the internet in general was more welcoming to women. Only 5% felt it was more welcoming to men. Now, what was the media reaction to this report, which really kind of ran counter to a lot of the narratives that had been pushed before that? Uh, a lot of reports, probably the majority, focused on those specific categories where women reported more abuse, like sexual harassment. And of course, the, the coverage was there were headlines that said, you know, things like this wasn't slayed. On the internet, men get called names, women get stalked and sexually harassed. Well, you know, there was also the, the issue of getting physical threats online, which, you know, was not mentioned in that headline. Um, and uh, generally, you know, the tenor of the coverage was to find ways to spin it as, oh, you know, women have it worse. And uh, really amusing was the fact that there were a couple of pieces by feminist bloggers who were just really baffled and frustrated that, you know, how can people say that the internet is equally or more welcoming to women? It's just infuriating that <laughs> people are not buying into the narrative. So, you know, that was the reaction. Uh, now, are there instances of women being subjected to severe harassment and even threats online? Sure, yeah, th this has happened. It's not, by the way, always by sexist men. Uh, one of the kind of paradigmatic stories was the experience of British feminist Carolyn Criado Perez, who received a series of you know, really deeply disturbing death and rape threats on Twitter. And, you know, I know it's just Twitter, but when you have the same person repeatedly tweeting at you saying, you know, I just got out of prison and I'm going to rape and kill you, yeah, you know, you don't really need to be very easily scared to kind of feel deeply unnerved by this. So, you know, I don't really blame her for being freaked out by this. It turned out, however, that the worst of this harassment came from a young woman who had a drinking problem and, you know, had a history of petty offenses, including assault, and whose explanation for why she sent those threats was basically just, well, I was bored out of my skull and really drunk, and I didn't have anything better to do. So, you know, it's really not necessarily these, you know, hordes of misogynist, you know, uh, awful men who want to keep women down and silence their voices. So, you know, uh, at the same time, uh, there is also no shortage of men who have received severe harassment and threats originating from online conflicts. I mean, I personally know some of those men. Uh, there are male political bloggers who have received harassment that included fake emergency calls that resulted in the police being sent to their homes. Uh, there are male you know, online activists who received threats that forced them to go into temporary hiding. Fortunately, it doesn't happen very often, but you know, it does happen. Uh, there are some men who were targets of smear campaigns online that forced that essentially caused them to lose their jobs. You know, this is again, you know, this is not just somebody calling you a bad name or you know uh, making a comment about the size of your genitalia. You know, it's uh, it's a little more serious than that. And of course, while some of those incidents did receive coverage, it was never it was certainly never in a gendered context. It was, it's never, you know, male blogger is forced to leave his home due to threats. Uh, one of the scariest, by the way, stories that I've seen of cyberstalking was told by a male writer, a British expatri expatriate who's living in the United States named James Lasden, who wrote a fascinating book in 2013 called Give Me Everything You Have on Being Stalked. Uh, this was a memoir about how he was targeted by a female student in his creative writing class who uh, had sort of mistaken his attention to her writing for romantic interest. He was married. He sort of made it really clear to her after a while that he was not interested in a romantic relationship. And then she escalated this from you know, abusive emails to emailing his colleagues, accusing him of stealing her work, accusing him of preying on his female students. So that there's, it, it's actually fascinating how a lot of her harassment relied on these uh, kind of stereotyped perceptions of men. And finally, she started accusing him of uh, essentially engineering her rape by somebody else. Uh, she posted similar slanders on websites including Amazon.com and Wikipedia. And he was terrified because he didn't know who was going to believe this. And he wrote that he could sort of see, you know, even though his colleagues knew that this woman was 
sort of not mentally well, he could sort of see a little glimmer of doubt, like, you know, maybe there's no smoke without fire. So, you know, and then she just gave up eventually. So this was kind of a terrifying story of cyberstalking. And, you know, written by a fairly notable um, a writer. And, you know, you would think that if a female writer had written a story like that about a male student in her creative writing class turning on her after she had rejected his overtures, this would be presented as this paradigmatic story of how, you know, even successful women are not immune to persecution by forces of patriarchy and misogyny. And uh, you know, this would definitely be treated as a political story. Uh, as it is, uh, this is an experience that doesn't get any political sympathy. Uh, the book got good reviews. However, there was one review in The New Yorker, which actually it took Lassen to task for not being sufficiently introspective and failing to recognize that he, uh, according to the reviewer, probably had a crush on this woman and kind of led her on. And this, was, I mean, this is the classic victim blaming. And you know, I, I think that the term is really overused, but it's kind of appropriate in this case. And of course, it would be called victim blaming if the, if the roles were reversed. Uh, so I think that this whole, the whole narrative of cyberbullying and uh, you know, cyber harassment and online misogyny is kind of a classic case of uh, the way that uh, public sympathies are skewed uh, based on gender. Uh, you know, to take something less extreme, uh, we are quick to sympathize, and you know, rightly so, with a woman who is engaged in an online debate and, you know, during a heated argument is told that she deserves to be raped. Yes, of course, that is absolutely unacceptable, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a very, very bad thing to do. But at the same time, when a man who expresses an opinion that someone dislikes is called a rapist, you know, is called a sexual predator, is called a pedophile, you know, which I, I have seen this happen with my own eyes, you know, on Twitter and in other social media, very few people, you know, people may see that as a bad thing. They're probably not going to see it as gendered harassment, even though it certainly is. You know, it's very, very unlikely that you know, if someone attacks a woman online for saying something that you know, the other person dislikes, uh, they're not going to call her a pedophile or a sexual predator. You know, they may say something. They may call her a slut. But you know, again, we, we see the uh, kind of discriminatory or the, the gender biased nature of one, but not of the other. And this is uh, just one instance of the uh, really skewed politics of gender and victimization. Uh, this is an example that I kind of chose because right now it's very topical, it's in the news, and it's something that you know affects us because most of us spend way too much time on the internet. <laughs> you know, that is where a lot of our public life currently is. But there's also no shortage of other uh, similar examples, some of which are more likely to have you know, real life consequences. Um, consider the discourse on sexual assault, which is a very sensitive topic, you know, understandably so. Uh, in the past several years, in the U.S. and Canada, in, in England, um, you know, in other places, there has been a very intense debate on what some people call a rape culture, uh, which is this notion that uh, our society condones and enables uh, rape and primarily male sexual abuse of women. Uh, this really, the, this issue kind of catapulted to the top of public attention with the case several years ago in Steubenville, which is a small American town in Ohio, where a severely intoxicated teenage girl was uh, sexually assaulted and abused by two high school football players while she was unconscious or barely conscious. And this is a story that stayed in the headlines for months. Uh, there was uh, a particular outrage over the fact that when the case first broke, many local people in the town where football is a very, very big thing uh, kind of rallied to the side of the boys and uh, you know, said some uh, kind of un un very unkind things about the girl, essentially saying that you know, she shouldn't have been drunk at the party. 
Uh, and, you know, you can sort of say, I, I think we can all agree that, yes, you know, people should behave more responsibly, but at the same time, you know, when a 15-year-old girl does something stupid, you know, I would say that that's not a reason to deny her sympathy uh, if, uh, if she is sexually assaulted. Uh, so and there, there, there were some ugly attitudes, and, and I think it was quite appropriate that they were denounced. But uh, at the same time, there was a narrative that was really vastly overblown. Uh, there, there were completely erroneous claims that there was a cover-up of the assault on, uh, until online activists kind of forced the hand of the local authorities, which is not true. In fact, the arrests were made immediately after the girl's parents went to the police. And yeah, many people in Steubenville were labeled rape apologists simply because before the trial, they said that the accused should be treated as innocent before proven guilty, or because they continued to support the football team. And there was very little sympathy given to local residents, both men and women, who had to deal with bomb threats at, at the school, who had their private online records hacked and exposed, speaking of cyber violence. And the other thing that was interesting is that around the same time, uh, there were several cases of sexual assault on male victims that received very little media attention. Everyone has heard of Steubenville, I'm sure in Canada also, you know, certainly in the United States. Uh, how many people have heard of Norwood, Colorado? Uh, probably no one, right? This was, a case, this was a case around the same time in which a 14-year-old uh, boy was uh, victimized by essentially sexual hazing on a football team. He was tied up with duct tape, and he was sexually penetrated with a pencil. Yes, so you know it was it was a pretty bad case, and you know that case uh, received very minimal media coverage. Uh, this is a case, by the way, in which the boy kind of became an outcast after he reported the assault. Again, you know, for the same reason that it was seen as directed at the football team. Uh, his father, who was the school principal, actually had to resign, and the family had to move to a different state. So, you know, the, the, the moral of the story is that this just does not just affect female victims. And yet, you know, very, very minimal coverage for this case. Uh, even less coverage for an incident in Homer, Alaska, where a teenage boy who passed out at a party was subjected to some really, really bad kind of degrading acts that culminated with being penetrated with a beer bottle, and you know, he actually suffered physical injuries. Uh, his male assailants were cheered on by both boys and girls who were present. And the only way that I even learned about the story, by the way, is that somebody mentioned it in a comment thread on a story about Steubenville. And then I went online and you know, found uh, other mentions of the story you know, only in uh, local papers in Alaska. Uh, so, you know, the amount of coverage was just dramatically different. And not to just uh, keep it to cases in which uh, the, both the victim and the perpetrator are male, um, there was a nauseating story um, last year in Southern Maryland uh, involving a teenage male victim and female perpetrators, uh, a 16-year-old boy with mental disabilities who was repeatedly tormented by two girls, 15 and 17, who, among other things, kicked him on the groin, uh, who forced him to perform various sexual acts, including sexual acts with a dog. Uh, I'm sorry to gross you all out, but you know that was the that was the story. This was filmed on these girls filmed it on video, and you know apparently showed it to some friends. Uh, it was a very shocking story. It was reported in the Washington Post, but. Uh, first of all, interesting thing, uh, most of the stories about, most of the articles about the story did not use the term sexual assault. They referred to it as bullying, they, they, they you know, they did say that the boy, some said the boy was tortured, which is, you know, which is accurate, but it's kind of interesting, again, that the term sexual assault was often not used. And there was certainly no call for a national conversation about, you know, how are we, how are we raising our daughters? And uh, also at the same time, uh, there was a different kind of story involving a male victim. Uh, the story of a young man named Brian Banks, who is a former high school football player. Uh, you may have heard this story because that one did get somewhat more exposure. Uh, 
this was a young man who was victimized by a false accusation of rape. Uh, he uh, spent six years in prison after being accused in his final year of high school of raping a female classmate, uh, Winnetta Gibson. Uh, he got out of prison. His hopes for a professional career in football were completely destroyed. Uh, he basically had to, you know, do manual labor because that was really, he couldn't get into any college. Um, so, you know, basically his life was, at that point seemed really pretty much destroyed. Uh, until his uh, so-called victim, who had received a settlement from the school district, by the way, for failing to ensure his safety, unexpectedly contacted him on Facebook uh, and said that she wanted to admit that she lied and she wanted to apologize, but she still didn't want to come forward because she didn't want to get in trouble and you know have to return the money. Now, he secretly recorded her confession, and as a result of this, he was exonerated. I don't think there have been, I think she, her family was forced to return what money they had left. I don't think she had been prosecuted. Uh, and this case did get a fair amount of exposure. Uh, what was interesting is that the CBS news magazine 60 Minutes uh, ran a story on Banks a few days after the Steubenville verdict. Uh, and on the CBS website, there were some commenters who felt that was insensitive to run a story about a false rape accusation when the nation's attention was focused on the depredations of rape culture and the victimization of women. Now, is there a history of misogynistic stereotypes toward women who come forward with accusations of rape? Absolutely, especially if those women are not, you know, paragons of virtue. There is, you know, it was really not that long ago in uh, the United States and in many other countries that, you know, a woman's uh, sexual history, even if completely irrelevant, could be brought up in uh, court to discredit her as a uh, rape complainant. Um, and there was this notion that, you know, the rape accusations are frequently the result of uh, sort of neurotic sexual fantasies and so on. Uh, what happened, however, is that we've replaced one set of rape myths with another that is equally extreme, uh, that essentially boils down to women don't lie about rape, or even if they do, it's so infinitesimal and exceptional that it really shouldn't affect the way that we view a typical rape accusation. Uh, now, by the way, uh, I've written about this. No one really knows what the actual rate of false accusations is. Uh, I think that there are some men's groups that I think have used the kind of overestimated figures of 50%. You know, the, 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 of course, some of the women's group will say it's one or 2%, which is you know, way too low. Uh, the bottom line is, again, nobody knows. The, there's the, the much repeated FBI figure in the United States of 8% you know, of all rape accusations being uh, uh, rejected as unfounded. Not all of these are necessarily false rape accusations, but at the same time, there are a lot of false accusations that do not end up in that 8%, because those are accusations that get dismissed at the earliest stage when the police believe there is kind of conclusive evidence no crime occurred. And sometimes they're wrong, by the way. It does happen. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't include, for instance, cases in which somebody is charged and then the charges are later dismissed before the trial. It doesn't include cases where someone is wrongly convicted on a false charge. And we do know that those things have happened. I mean, Brian Banks is just one of you know, a number of cases that I have been able to found, find which you know, did not get a lot of attention. And of course, we um, all saw what happened with the uh, University of Virginia case, uh, where there was no specific man that was accused. There was the, the story in Rolling Stone of this, the woman identified as Jackie, uh, claiming this horrific rape at, uh, at a fraternity party. And really, you know, honestly, if you look at that story, it's really so obvious that it didn't happen. Uh, I, and I don't want to, you know, say that, oh, you know, I'm so perceptive and everybody else isn't. You know, I thought when I, this, the first time I read that story, I thought, oh my God, you know, this is really horrible. The second time I read it, I thought, wait a minute, you know, there are just a lot of things here that do not add up. 
Uh, and you know, th th there were there were other people that I know who had the same reaction. Um, I mean, a friend of mine thought it was nonsense the first time I read it. So she, she read it, so you know, it's uh, it, it certainly uh, there were a lot of really obviously implausible things. And yet, you know, the story eventually fell apart uh, after the fraternity house was vandalized. After you know, again, there was no specific accused man, but it, it, practically every member of the fraternity became a kind of suspect. Um, and then, of course, even when information started coming out more and more, showing that you know this just didn't happen, and that you know, there were many, many things contradicting her version of the events, there was a growing amount of evidence that you know the guy who supposedly took her to this party was a figment of her own imagination, where she you know, tried to persuade her friends that she had this glamorous boyfriend from a frat. Um, and yet, you know, there were all these activists who kind of continued to stand with Jackie to the bitter end, and you still find a few who insist that, well, we don't know that something didn't happen to her. Well, you know, if that's your standard, uh, uh, it, it's really impossible, virtually impossible to prove that something didn't happen to a person, you know. Uh, I mean, I could tell you that I've been abducted by a UFO, and you know, there would be no way to prove that that didn't happen, but... Um, and the other thing that is interesting here is, you know, we're, we're now half a century past the birth of second wave feminism, which began with Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963, and then the founding of the National Organization for Women. And, you know, 50 years into that, it's kind of remarkable to me that today, the kind of iconic image of woman in so much feminist discourse is not woman as achiever, not woman as a doer, not you know, woman as a hero, and we certainly have many, many examples of women who've achieved remarkable things. No, it's the image of woman as victim of male violence, especially sexual violence. And the really profound irony here is that th this iconic image of woman as victim of sexual violence and abuse is a deeply traditional image from you know patriarchal culture going all the way back to ancient Greek myth where really like every other notable woman is somebody who you know got raped by a god essentially uh, or you know or by some warlord or you know or uh, um, you know who was taken prisoner and you know sold into sexual slavery. Uh, where, you know, in Roman history, we have Lucretia, you know, the, the matron who was raped and committed suicide, and, you know, it brought down the Roman monarchy, um, and that was sort of the, the embodiment of feminine virtue. And it's also ironic because in some contexts today, feminists are deeply critical of images of women as victims. Um, feminist uh, culture critic Anita Sarkeesian, who you know is familiar to most people here, has denounced the trope of women as damsels in distress in video games and in other uh, media. Uh, there's a group called Women Action in the Media, which has cited studies showing that when the news media cover women, it is to disproportionately focus on women as victims, and they regard that as a problem. And you know, I think they're right. But the damsel in distress is really also today's principal feminist paradigm. And really, it seems that all that matters is whether women are being damseled from the correct ideological perspective. Um, and you know, that's uh, that's really the only question. Um, there is an equally uh, long and patriarchal tradition of downplaying male victimization and you know sometimes playing it for laughs especially if it's victimization by a woman the battered husband is a kind of figure of fun starting with you know medieval fables and you know down to modern day comic strips and you know Kermit and Miss Biggie <laughs> it's uh, you know it, it's very very pervasive uh, now, I think that sometimes uh, the, 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 some of the rhetoric from men's groups, I think, kind of veers a little toward, um, you know, extremes, just like the rhetoric of some feminist groups. There are men who will say, you know, men's activists who will say, oh, you know, no one really cares when, you know, men and boys are victimized. 
I think that's entirely true. I think, you know, for instance, if we look at the uh, plight of child soldiers in third world countries, you know, there has been a lot of attention to that. Uh, or, you know, the victims of police brutality. Uh, what is different is that when the victimization of male, males, you know, men and boys is recognized, it is portrayed generally as a generic human issue, as with, you know, child soldiers, or as a racial or ethnic issue. And the gender component is really invisible. And, you know, for instance, there has been a lot of talk in the United States, um, I don't know if it's as much of an issue here in Canada, but racial profiling by the police. Um, you know, it is a, a very complex kind of demographic problem. What no one ever mentions is gender profiling, which is, you know, incredibly systematic. There is a lot of evidence that like, even with things like speeding, you know, women are less likely to get pulled over by the cops if they're speeding. Like if uh, there have been studies showing that if um, when they use a radar, uh, you know, when they use a, a detector uh, so that it's not, you know, the police personal, making a personal judgment, uh, the women get arrested at a higher rate than when it's just the cops sitting in a car and, you know, watching people go by. So, you know, there is certainly gender profiling, which never gets mentioned. There is a lot of evidence, you know, including, for instance, um, uh, studies that are done by uh, Canadian um, men's uh, issues activist Farrell Christensen, who is a currently retired professor of philosophy at the University of Alberta, uh, showing that male victims of violent crime are generally viewed with less sympathy than female victims. Uh, they're, you know, the perpetrators in uh, hypothetical cases are given uh, less severe punishment when the victim is male, even when it's specified that it's a slightly built male who is, you know, as incapable of you know, fending off an attack as the average woman. Uh, so, you know, I think that that is um, that is a, uh, a pervasive problem that. Uh, uh, that exists and that we're not really talking about. I'll give you one more recent news story that I think is kind of, it's horrible and it's really interesting in terms of, again, you know, if this was uh, a gender reverse story, I think it would be treated very differently. Uh, there is a recent case in the United States in which uh, a girl uh, basically kind of coaxed a boy into suicide. You may have heard about this. Uh, he was sort of her online boyfriend, and it's not really clear why she did this. He was depressed, and I think she wanted to be a kind of object of sympathy if her boyfriend committed suicide, and she essentially kept badgering him and, you know, telling him that, you know, it's really better for you if you kill yourself. And it, it's, it's just, it's a really, really awful case of psychological manipulation, and, uh, uh, Again, you know, if the genders were reversed, I think this would really be seen as this, you know, uh, this very politicized case of male psychological control over women and, you know, male dominance. And, you know, as it is, yes, you know, people believe it's a horrible case, but, you know, no one, no one is making a national cause out of this. And, uh, you know, this is not being seen as a kind of gender specific thing. Uh, so I think one of the things that has happened uh, is that I think we're, we're very aware, you know, in the critique of uh, patriarchy, which I think is a vastly, vastly overused term, uh, but in the critique of patriarchy, we're very aware of its misogynist aspects, the kind of the negative judgments of women, you know, the portrayal of women as uh, kind of tempters and sinners and liars and so on. We're not really quite as aware of the, uh, you know, what in, so in the social sciences is known as positive sexism. And it's kind of interesting, again, that, you know, sexism in favor of women is defined as positive. Um, but it, we're not really quite as aware of the paternalism and chivalry that are also uh, you know, at least in Western culture, uh, very, very much a part of the traditional mindset. And I do think, by the way, that there are people who write about men's issues who sometimes kind of overstate chivalry and treat it as a universal phenomenon. 
it's really not. It's an aspect primarily of Western culture after a certain point of time in the 12th century. And to some extent, in genuinely male-dominated societies where you know women in many ways were the kind of uh, were semi-property of their husbands, you know. Chivalry kind of modified patriarchy in a way, and I think there's a theory that that's kind of that's that was one of the reasons for its rise. That you know, for instance, when there was a kind of widespread view that it was okay for men as heads of families to beat their wives as a form of you know maintaining domestic discipline, the view that you know it's unmanly and unchivalrous to hit a woman kind of served as a restraint on that. And you know, made women's situation better. Uh, however, you know, we have this very interesting situation today where you know women have equal rights. Women have, um, you know, despite the persistence of certain gender-based stereotypes, and we can debate, you know, which one, which of them are rooted in biological differences and which are rooted in culture. But you know, certainly women have you know, vast opportunities. Women have equal rights in, you know, every, in every way in Western societies. And when chivalry persists in that context, I think arguably it can and does become a form of female privilege. And you know, I, I, there's you know, the phrase male privilege is kind of vastly overused, but that's another thing that we don't really talk about. So, for instance, today, you know, we're aware of the misogynist myth that women typically lie about rape. We're not as aware of the historical paternalistic sympathy for female victims if they were the right kind of victims. In the American South, under Jim Crow, uh, the lynching of black men accused of rape was frequently defended on the grounds that it would be inhumane and unchivalrous to force the you know innocent white uh, female victim to testify about her ordeal and horror of horrors to have her veracity questioned by a defense attorney, and you know have to prove uh, that you know her story is true. Now today there are some feminists who would extend that attitude to all rape accusations. So the politics change, and in some ways the dynamics of paternalism really do remain the same. Uh, meanwhile, men who are victims of false accusations are seen as sort of unworthy victims. Now, in response to advocacy for men's issues, many feminists have said that the problems facing men, including the denial of male victimization, are not due to feminism but to patriarchy, and that feminism is working on these issues. Uh, now, there are a few instances in which I think that there is a kind of sliver of truth to this. Uh, for instance, the statutory rape of males uh, was not recognized at all you know, before the feminist push for gender-neutral legislation. So, you know, for instance, we, we complain today about the fact that you know, if a 35-year-old woman has sex with a 12-year-old boy, you know, she typically gets a much lesser punishment than you know, a male uh, with a female victim in that situation. However, until the mid-1970s, it would not have been a crime at all. Statutory rape was uh, completely gender-specific. And it was feminist reformers who campaigned for gender-neutral legislation who got that changed. Uh, but for the most part, when you look at the ways that feminists have responded to men's issues, um, I think we find, well, I wouldn't even really say a mixed record. I, I think for the most part, it's a pretty negative record. And I think typical of this is the fact that you know, when you look at online debates, uh, when somebody brings up you know, men's issues, the typical feminist response is to accuse them of deflecting, derailing, mansplaining, you know, my, my favorite word. And it, it really, by the way, kind of boggles my mind that we have this explicitly sexist term that is now uh, kind of okay to use in the mainstream media. You know, I, I still remember that when I first saw it in a mainstream publication, I thought, oh, you know, this is insane. And, you know, it, it just continues. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, um, you know, it just never ceases to amaze me. Um, so, you know, and this is also um, kind of the same in, um, uh, in uh, the, the way that feminists, uh, well, most feminists, again, you know, approach the discussion of issues. Um, if we look at, for instance, domestic violence against men, 
Well, is it true that the uh, kind of neglect of male victims of domestic violence is in large part due to kind of patriarchal attitudes and stereotypes? Yes, because you know, men are presumed to be the stronger sex, so you know, there is an assumption that if you get beat up by a woman, you know, you're really a figure of ridicule, you're unmanly, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And I, I think that, it, I think there is a great deal of truth to, you know, saying that this is an aspect of patriarchal attitudes, but instead of trying to dismantle those attitudes, feminists, for the most part, you know, with some exceptions, have actually perpetuated them and given them a kind of politically correct spin. Like, you know, we're not really supposed to say that men are physically stronger than women because, of course, we also want women to have equal opportunity as firefighters and so on. But we can say that men have more social power, you know, whatever that means. And certainly, I would say that as victims of domestic violence, women certainly have way more social power than men. You know, the, the agencies that work on these issues primarily cater to women. Again, I know about Canada, but in the United States, at one point, uh, legal aid societies had programs for battered women only. I think some of them, after being sued, kind of changed their policies to, uh, to, expand, uh, to expand them to men. But there has been a tremendous amount of resistance from feminist groups to allowing uh, the discussion of men as victims of domestic violence. Um, and you know, recently when uh, the soccer player Hope Solo was arrested for uh, family violence, for you know, violence against her sister and her 17-year-old nephew, and some people said, well, you know, what about the female sports star who you know gets arrested for domestic violence? You know, why don't why aren't we calling for her to be disqualified? And suddenly we had all these feminist commentators explaining why this is different and you know the dynamics of gender and power, you know, and so on and so forth. Another interesting example, and I should probably be wrapping up pretty soon, right? Because I think we do want to leave some time for questions. But um, just to give you one more example that I think is is uh, interesting again in terms of feminist attitudes. Um, uh, the definition of rape uh, by the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, which uh, does th these you know, uh, very, very large studies of sexual and domestic violence. Um, so the CDC uh, defines, uh, has a fairly broad definition of rape where you know, I personally think that a lot of what they're capturing is not really rape so much as intoxicated sex. <coughs> Their question, uh, I think, is very misleading in terms of you know, allowing people to, and, and by the way, this is not people say, you know, people actually reporting that they've been raped. It's the, the researchers deciding that certain answers to certain questions get you classified as a victim of rape. So for instance, if you report, and there's a very broadly worded question about intoxicated sex, where they count you as a victim, if you say that you know, you've been penetrated when uh, you, know, you were drunk. And, uh, the interesting thing is that when you, when you ask men a similar question about being you know, forced to penetrate, uh, which is the way that they word it. And when, when you ask similar questions about um, you know, unwanted intercourse when, when intoxicated, you get very similar numbers from men. Now, because of semantics, the CDC doesn't count that as rape, but as sexual coercion. You know, so the, 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 only the women who uh, have you know, what the CDC defines as forced intercourse or defined as rape victims. Now, you know, do I want to say that you know all of these men should be all of these men and women should be counted as rape victims? No, I personally think the CDC definition is way way too broad, and I think we need to be more specific. You know, are we talking about actual forced intercourse? Are we talking about someone being genuinely incapacitated, or you know, having impaired judgment because of alcohol? However, you know, my problem is if you are going to use that classification for women, you really have to also use it for men. You can't say, you know, it's rape in case of uh, you know, women, but not of men. 
And of course, you know, this is where, again, you, you get a complete uh, kind of resistance from most of the feminist community uh, to, uh, to a consistency. Uh, now, what I want to say in conclusion is I'm really not calling here for, you know, let's have more male victimhood. I mean, I personally think really that the last thing we need is for men to kind of join this victim Olympics that we have going on where now finally everybody can be a victim class and you know then you know uh, then it kind of you know we're, at that point we're not really sure who the oppressor is anymore but you know we're all victims right you know uh, I think that what we need is to recognize you know genuine victimization where it occurs regardless of gender um, we need to extend sympathy to victims regardless of gender uh, while at the same time kind of discouraging a victim mentality. Again, I think cyberbullying is a really good example of this. We simultaneously, I think, are insufficiently aware of really severe uh, cyber harassment that is experienced by men, by which I would, you know, I would mean, you know, threats that have some credibility as opposed to, you know, somebody saying, kill yourself on the internet. Um, you know, uh, we have people who are being systematically harassed, you know, smeared in ways that have real life consequences. Yes, absolutely. I think we, we have a problem with law enforcement not really knowing quite, you know, how to deal with that in many cases. I think we need to work on that. We need to work on that in a gender neutral way, while at the same time, I think that there's a very real danger of defining cyber harassment so broadly that we're endangering freedom of speech online. You know, we have people saying that, you know, it's cyber harassment if you screen cap my tweet and, you know, tweet it uh, as an example of something ridiculous so that, you know, people can make fun of it. Well, I'm sure it's unpleasant, but, you know, it's uh, really not going, I mean, if that severely traumatizes you, you really should not be online, you know, <laughs> I would say. Um, so I think that's a really good example. Um, I think that, you know, right now we have unfortunately far too much of kind of bickering online between the extreme feminists and some of the angrier, you know, men's rights activists. Um, I mean, I think that the label of MRA is just horribly overused. I mean, these days it's like, you know, if you say something that a feminist disagrees with on gender issues, you're an MRA, but, you know, at the same time, uh, there are some MRAs who I think do give their cause a bad name. You know, I'm not gonna mention any names, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it does exist. I think, you know, jo unfortunately, websites like Jezebel have their male counterparts, and, uh, you know, I sometimes think that it would be a really good idea to just put them all in a big football field and let them fight it out. <laughs> and, you know, and I think a lot of people would pay to see that. <laughs> you, know, that could, you could make a lot of money with that. So, but seriously though, I think the, uh, unfortunately there's a lot of bickering, there's a lot of you know, debates about, well, you know, were women really oppressed historically or were men more oppressed because they had to fight wars? Well, I think we can all agree that you know, for most of history, most people had miserable lives, you know, and were, were oppressed in, you know, many, many ways. Um, you know, I think bickering about, you know, who was more oppressed and were women really oppressed is really kind of pointless. And I think we have to look at the here and now. I mean, it really doesn't affect me much if, you know, women, um, you know, 400 years ago could be executed for adultery. I mean, I think we should be paying more attention to what's happening in some societies right now, you know, where that is still going on. But, you know, I, I think the situation in, you know, in uh, many third world countries is absolutely a legitimate feminist issue. Um, but, you know, right now, I think we really have to recognize that both men and women have their issues. Both men and women face, you know, in Western society, certain biases. You know, I am speaking here as somebody who, you know, I, as, some, as many of you probably know, I came to this country from the Soviet Union in 1980. I was uh, initially very excited when I discovered feminism. I found it very inspiring. Um, I sort of started having a lot of questions about it and, you know, the direction in which it was going. Uh, in subsequent years. And, you know, today uh, I often get asked, you know, am I a feminist? And I don't really know how to answer that because, 
you know, I don't want to do this trick of going to the dictionary definition of feminism, which is wonderful, because unfortunately, many people who use the, I would say most people today who are using the label are really not, uh, you know, espousing the equality and equal treatment and, you know, equal standards that uh, the historical definition of feminism was about. So, you know, I'm not really hung up on labels. You know, if you want to call yourself a feminist and you're genuinely pro-equality, that's great. You know, if you want to call yourself an egalitarian, you know, more power to you. I would say that what we need is, you know, not so much a women's movement or a men's movement. I think we really need, and I think in that respect, you know, CAFE. I, I love that, you know, it's called the Canadian Association for Gender Equality. I think we need a gender equality movement, you know, regardless of labels. And that, I think, is the only way to kind of get us forward rather than remain stuck in this uh, mentality of anger and victimization. And that is where I'm going to leave you, and I'll be happy to take questions.